On today's episode, we're getting divisional again. The NFC West breaking down those four teams, as well as some quick best ball tips. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, like this video, and make sure you leave us a comment. We ask for a very specific comment later on in the show. Enjoy. Foot Clan, before we start today's show, I wanted to remind you about the 2022 Ultimate Draft Kit. How ultimate is it, Jason? So ultimate. Tier based rankings, premium stat projections, 100 plus player profile videos. Uh, we've upgraded the app. We've upgraded the cheat sheet creator. Uh, you can custom mark players. You can import leagues from uh, now Sleeper, ESPN, and Yahoo. Turn ADP or age on off on your cheat sheets. All sorts of goodies. Yeah, sleepers, breakouts, bus values. Definitely check it out, ultimatedraftkit.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Thursday, July 14th. The Fantasy Footballers back with you. Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway. The Deucers are here. We have Al Borland, Judge Giamatti, Kyle the Borgogan, and uh, he has a full house. Full house in the middle of an Arizona afternoon in our studio. Just uh, cool. it's not recommended. Yeah, I mean, it gets a little toasty. Six dudes <laughs> in a room <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the height of the heat. 113 degrees outside, 112 degrees inside. Yeah, I mean, we have all the AC blasts, and so it's down to one, 112, 111. Uh, NFC West breakdown on today's show. That's going to be the focus. We've been doing the divisional breakdowns. Uh, recapping some of the off season, uh, pointing your attention to the most relevant stories for each of these teams and where they're headed, players that might have seasons to remember and seasons to forget. So going to be breaking down the good old NFC West today and uh, for the first time ever, you know, in a long time actually, talking about the NFC West and not talking about Russell Wilson. hey -o. So that's going to be different. That's so nice. That is so nice. I mean, it's just it, it just he's the worst. Really? Oh, you don't yeah. like you don't like Russ? No, what? He, he's very limited. Unlimited. Uh, I've heard he's unlimited. No, he posted from him. He posted a big video. Did you see that? Yeah, no more. He's working out. Something about the doubt. Yeah, he he's, doesn't like the doubt, and he he loves to work. Now he's working. I mean, I, I assume he was working before, right, Brooks? Do you know if he was working before? I hope so. He's only working as hard as Pete Carroll would let him. Seahawks averaged 10.4 wins per year with Russell Wilson since his arrival. So yeah. if you want to say you like something, whether he's the worst or not, he was the best oh, he's great at for that team. He's great at football. I think he's going to be great for fantasy this year. Um, I have a lot of shares of him on my underdog leagues. Yeah, he's in the ultimate draft kit as one of our values, I believe, right now. Yeah, I like him. But, like, you don't like Russell Wilson, though, right? Like, He's a weird guy. Yeah, okay. Just wanted to clear that up. Well, been, like, limited. His, I, I think you're trying to. I think you're, I think you're trying to turn the oh, page. I'm, I'm trying to because I'm very excited for him on the Broncos yeah. and what's going to happen with everybody on the Broncos. But I, I, I got to meet this Who do you guy. like more, Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson? Oh, Russell Wilson. Oh, that's a good <laughs> question. I mean, I Wait, know I just, just bagged on the dude, but. I mean, like. Who would you rather have dinner with? Because I, I get that Rodgers is viewed as Aaron Rodgers. He's a bit of a curmudgeon, and it's like I, I'm a, I, I get it. I sometimes you want to be a curmudgeon, and you just don't want to put up with people's crap anymore. You're familiar with curmudgeon. Yeah, I, I know. I think me and Rodgers will get along just fine. So a dinner with Rodgers? Yeah, you'd okay. sit at dinner and you'd both eat. Nobody in talks. Silence. Just yeah. nobody talking. It would be silence, or it would just be really deep philosophical things about things that probably shouldn't be examined Slash like that taking turns complaining about the service yeah what but not like al it'll be hmm. he would be the hmm. face hmm. the face he makes when he, he throws an interception yeah. but it's the receiver's fault every take a bite hmm. Hmm. There's it, a, we just lock eyes hmm. there's hmm. a chance he orders something and it's his own choice but he's really mad that oh, the, the, chef the waiter no that the waiter didn't suggest something different 
Oh, that's what Rogers would do. <laughs> Why didn't you recommend something he, I would like more? He uh, he seems very much like. Yeah, uh, what's the, what's the special today? Oh well, it's you know the 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 lobster with the roasted garlic potatoes. And lets the waiter go on and on and on. I'll have the steak. That's true. Yeah, and then Russ. But every time you got to make sure you know what the special is, and then not order it. Yeah, and Russ eats with his mouth open. So, <laughs> Twitter at the FF Ballers. If you want to follow the show, you can follow Jason at Jason FFL, Mike at FF Hitman. You can follow me at Andy Holloway. Uh, and we're on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube.com slash The Fantasy Footballers. You can watch the show over there. Uh, nothing really by way of news today. So one minor, <laughs> tiny piece of news. I guess it's not a signing, yeah, no, it's so really, I can't hit the button. Real shame because this is like perfect for the mediocre signing of the week. But it's a mediocre trade of the week. Do it anyways. Mediocre signing of the week. The Patriots traded first round, former first round wide receiver Nikhil Harry to the Bears. For a 2024 seventh. They they wanted to insult Nikhil Harry as much as possible. Like uh, When I'm that pick comes up, they'll be like, how do we get this again? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure the Bears offered the 2023. They're like, no. Nah. No. Nah. Push it back. So, uh, the only reason it's really worth mentioning is because the Bears wide receiver room is so incredibly depleted that I mean could Nikhil Harry start beside Darnell oh, yeah. Mooney he's, yeah he's the second best wide receiver on this team uh with Byron Pringle uh, okay I mean Valus Jones we we don't know the Bears clearly liked him as they took him with a day two pick uh we do have a fun fact here that though <laughs> that's Nikhil Harry Younger than Velas Jones. Wow. No. Is wait a minute. Is that true? That's from the Borg Gogan, so I take that as That's gospel. awesome. That is so great. I, I Those are always so funny when they come up. You know, somebody is a four year player and then someone leaves early and they've been in the league for I mean, it feels I like, like the, Nikhil, Harry, Nikhil Harry's been failing for how many years? I mean three three, three, three. at least. They what I like though is it was worded Nikhil Harry still younger. As oh. if there was a chance or an option that he could pass him. have surpassed him. Yeah, uh, I am ashamed to admit this out loud, but I constantly live in my shame, so it's that's a safe fine. space. Um, <laughs> but I picked up Nikhil Harry off of a dynasty waiver this morning. So which wait? No, not a league you're in. Uh, so you're you're okay. But okay. I mean, check the waivers if if you need. To. He got picked up in our main dyna league. I'm and, surprised and I he's not people. being held in most of them because of the. You know, he's probably the rookie 101 in a lot of drafts. Yes, he was. So those people probably just held on for dear life, not letting him go. Um, I don't think he's going to matter for fantasy. This doesn't change my opinion of Darnell Mooney. This doesn't change my opinion on Colt Komet having uh, massive involvement in the offense. It doesn't and, even change my opinion on Justin Fields. I don't I don't think this no. is a needle mover. Uh, Justin I think that adding Harry to this roster is it, is worth at least two to three passing touchdowns. I would take the under. Yeah, I'm not sure. But maybe. Maybe. We can we can hope that Nikhil can turn a page. And look, he was super talented coming into the NFL. Uh, highly regarded. Didn't work out at all in New England. Sometimes you wonder what that means because, yeah, you know. It could be a him and the Patriots thing. Yeah, some just don't. Bill Belichick, certain players, it doesn't work out. But that's the only news I got for you. Unless something else is uh, breaking right now. No, no. That's good stuff. Let's go west. Let's do it. Let's get divisional. I thought you were going to hit us with a go west, young man. Wow. Michael W. Wow. Smith reference. And I was going to say, what, what are you doing? Obviously, that's the first thing I thought of, Mike, but I wasn't willing to go to that. Oh, I am. That far away of a reference. People are Googling as we speak. Um, NFC West breakdown, Rams, Cardinals, 49ers, Seahawks, talking about them today. Looking at the offenses, what they did last year, how they could function this year, um, some of our takeaways, players to pay attention to, and uh, if you want to dig deeper, you can you can jump into the UDK. There are consistency charts in there, market share charts, team opportunity, and the dynasty pass. Uh, you can check that out. But the Rams, let's let's begin there. Things kind of worked out for the Rams last year. Uh, Twelve and five had a projected win total before the year of ten surpassed that obviously and then uh heading into 2022 
10.5 is the line for the Rams defending Super Bowl champions. So this was a, uh, a really good offense, uh, a steady offense with Matthew Stafford behind center, seventh in points per game, dead uh, middle here, 15th in pace of play. You know, one of the storylines that jumps out at the top to me is just how you know, deficient they were in running back weapons last year. Mm -hmm. They had to make a midseason pivot to Sonny Michelle, which kind of worked out. Um, Daryl Henderson wasn't bad when he played. He just gets hurt all the time. But he gets hurt all the time. And then you obviously had the return of Cam Akers at the very, 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 very end of the year, which, look, it wasn't much of a return. It was kind of a a wave while he was running for one or two a carry. But heading into the new year, you know, the team looks a little different. Allen Robinson, wide receiver, free agent addition. Uh, goodbye, Robert Woods. Right now it's goodbye, Odell Beckham Jr. Sonny Michelle's gone. What is? Where are your expectations? Where are your um, storylines here with the Rams? I, I think the main storyline to dive into first is Cam Akers and what you believe there because I think that – We've seen the McVay system. He's always going to figure it out. He's always going to have a top offense. But I think he prefers when he can have a strong running game. He prefers when he had Todd Gurley and, and can run. They tried to do this even in the playoffs. I mean, uh, he had 32% uh, of the team's rush attempts plus team targets. 30 is elite. And that's while he sucked. I mean, right. he was very, very bad. They want Cam Akers to be the dude. And I want him to. I loved him coming out. We, I think we all were very, very – everyone yeah, was high on Cam Akers. Um, unfortunately, he had the Achilles heel of running back injuries. Ironically, it's the Achilles. Um, but is that, it ironic or is it just like more really, really well named? It, uh, that's, that's fair. That's fair. This is really well named um, because, no, we don't have any successful stories of running backs coming back to high fantasy relevance after an Achilles injury. Ever. I there right, we don't have one. Do we have one? No, I mean not really. To high level, to high level. we have not we've not seen an elite running back return yet. Yeah, I, I think of it in terms of like a full season. Like really putting up a nice stat line over the course of a year. We've seen burst games from players. The anti Foreman had them. Sure. Um you know the what what kind of blew my mind was that Cam Akers wasn't just back, he was back as the R B one. He was back with high utilization and high involvement in this offense, and so there was this, I don't know, surprise by everybody that they would go to him so often. They had other options. It's not like they couldn't have spared him a little bit. So you go into the year and you say, hey, Cam Akers is going to get 15 touches a game on a great offense. What does it mean? And he's What's a year it going to translate and he's to? he's a year removed from the Achilles injury. So you have to call your shot on whether you believe that he is fully recovered. And he is – I think the nice thing about this is he was so young. Obviously, his return in about six months was unprecedented. He didn't look great, but the fact that he was so young, seems to be recovered, has that timeline, and we have the confidence that they are going to really, really, really try to make him the guy. He's got the opportunity that sometimes you just don't get after an Achilles injury. So uh, are we are we staring down – and I'm sorry, Jason – do you want to finish that well, thought? My, my, my conclusion is basically that I think it's worth taking a shot on Cam Akers because the team is going to give him the opportunity. It's just a matter of does an Achilles injury mean that a running back can never get back to physical form again? And at yeah, his I mean, age, I don't believe that. At his age, I, I, I think he could get back. Um, is this going to be the running back version of the Stafford Cup? doubt that people had in the offseason last year where it should you know we, we talked about it being that obvious thing that it should have been obvious but wasn't obvious is cam Akers going to be that i mean to me the team is done with any sort of primary role for daryl henderson yeah that's not going to be part of their future now he may get you know reps but is this a more obvious thing or is it fair to have this injury doubt i i think having the injury doubt is completely fair uh but i agree with jason it your opinion of Cam Akers, like it, it doesn't really matter. It, it matters what Sean McVay wants, and at least through the playoffs, Sean McVay said that Cam Akers is is our guy. He's going to be our workhorse running back, and he will continue to be that heading into next season. So, at the running back sixteen where he's being drafted, 
he seems like a guy that he, to me the in the range of outcomes is not he doesn't you know show up as the running back 13 running back 14 he either crushes his ADP or he reaggravates and just he he is so no, I, uncredi- incredibly inefficient with the volume that he doesn't even hit the running back 16. And we may need to do a show, Brooksy, specifically about players in that category because you're right. Cam Akers isn't what – he will not finish where he's being drafted, I don't think. I think he will be a disaster or, or a huge yep, value. I agree. Um, maybe not as big as the – value Cooper Cup was last year but <laughs> yeah I mean I, I I made my speech for the pro Cam Akers but when you look at who he's being drafted around and there is this giant question mark we just covered um the NFC East Zeke was uh, a talking point on that episode he's going one one running back spot ahead of Akers and James Connor one running back spot behind I would take either one of those guys over yeah, Cam Akers I would too because they don't have quite that same gigantic question mark Matthew Stafford finishes the quarterback five last year, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of feels like Zeke did. He's, yeah, he's where so Zeke bizarre. ended up at what running back six, and yeah. and so there was consistency. I mean, he was out there for every single game. Um, it was funny. I just rewatched that. Uh, you remember the injury he suffered as a rookie in Detroit? Oh, and then he came back, and in then the he game? came back in and threw yeah. the touchdown because the Browns were dumb enough to call a timeout and let him back in the game. Yeah. Um, but it just reminded me like Stafford is an iron man. Like he plays through as much as he can last year, almost 5,000 yards, 41 touchdowns, 17 picks. Some of the interceptions definitely cost him, but overall it worked out. I mean, this was a player that, you know, was very consistent. He's being drafted as the quarterback 12 right now. Um, is that too low? No, no, I, I would say... If, Is that too high? Yeah, yeah I, I would say it's too high. Obviously, last year was great. He finishes the quarterback five, but if you look at how that came about, he was pretty inconsistent. He had plenty of weeks where he was, you know, ha- half of his weeks wasn't a top 12 option. The The reason he finished top five was because in those down weeks where he really did not help you for fantasy, he didn't just like collapse and give you nothing you know he would he would go out there and give you 16 points um 14.3 points and you know looking at his game log it's like okay well he's he's not crushing you and killing you but he's not giving you a win and to me I think that you know this was as good as it could possibly get I don't think anyone would project Cooper Cup to repeat what he did last year um so do you like Rodgers or Stafford more this year Rodgers without Devontae Adams. I have Stafford one spot ahead of Rodgers. One spot right higher. Now. Yeah, because uh, last year he did have 10 top 12 performances, which was the same as uh, Aaron Rodgers, your um, dinner date, Mike. Yes. Uh, so, oh, I'd love to have dinner with Stafford, yeah. though. Yeah. Would you? Oh, heck yeah. Really? I don't know what Stafford's I've seen him like. chug a beer. <laughs> So that's that. That's the line for a good that dinner? Just, that's that what just you means need? he's going to be there to have a good time. We're gonna we're gonna go out. We're gonna have a great dinner. It's staff. Reach out. Okay. Reach out at Applebee's. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's our na- neighborhood grill. You know. Um, <laughs> Allen Robinson uh, uh, joins the uh, passing attack. That was number two in passing touchdowns. Number five in passing yards. Um, number one in expected points added per pass attempt. This was a good passing offense. Yes. So Allen Robinson. You know, th- there is a stink upon that man's name in the fantasy football community. Deserved. I mean. Deserved, but but also acquired in part maybe by Matt Nagy, right? I mean. Sure. Like, I, where I, does the stink begin? Nobody knows the source of the stink when Nagy's in the yes, same building. I, I agree, and that's that's part of the huge question for him. But, that like, that didn't stop, you know, the switch over to Justin Fields and just everything that was terrible about the Chicago Bears that didn't stop Darnell Mooney from getting a thousand yards last year and having some productive fantasy weeks. Meanwhile, Allen Robinson, who should have been rock solid, was absolutely atrocious. He did particularly torture Mike Wright. Yes, and I, I still, I still can't figure out where I am on Allen Robinson being drafted. As a top 24 wide receiver. That might be too high. 
the, the, the hard part is this offense is going to be so good. While you were talking about Stafford, Jay, I, I get it. He was very hot or cold for, for fantasy last year. That's his first year with McVay. Like, Stafford sure. is a good quarterback. They're in the range of outcomes is Matthew Stafford has this system just locked in this year, and he is even better and throws, you know, in the mid forties of touchdowns. The yardage goes goes up. You hit you you hit on those deep plays a little bit more. You would expect in year two for You'd him to not throw yes. seventeen touchdowns as well. So there there are exceptions. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh there there I is, don't expect him to throw seventeen touchdowns either. Uh there is room for take more. Stafford to get better. Um and whenever you've got Cooper Cup in tow, it's 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 a good situation with regards to Allen Robinson. Though I mean, he's, we're all lower on him. Yes, all lower compared on, to average draft position. Yes, we have him as our wide receiver thirty four, forty six, and fifty two. So we we kind of are out on Allen Robinson, who is being drafted much much higher in the fifth round as I think wide receiver twenty three. Do you want do you want Adam Thielen or Allen Robinson? Because they feel very. I'll take Thielen. Similar. I'll take Thielen. They do feel similar. I'll take Thielen because of the scars and the burns that I have from Allen Robinson. Okay, he started fair. 12 games. He played 12 oh. games last year. His high score was eight fantasy points. Yeah. Last year, you need to make it not exist if you want to be in on Allen Robinson. Yep. Because you, you don't know where the crash began in Chicago. It was – it was everyone got in on it, um, except for Mooney maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's tough because Robinson, I think one of the question marks is, do they bring back Odell Beckham? Is Van Jefferson going to be involved? I'm not worried. Uh, Beckham, with the injury that late, like in all the talk, is he won't be ready till November. Yeah, but it's still it's still something to be considered, I think. If, if Allen Robinson can be anywhere from two to four on the actual pecking order of the wide receiver room, that'd be a problem to me. Like Al Adam Thielen is not going to be the fourth best wide receiver in Minnesota. Oh, okay. I so see when, what you're saying. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm saying like I would definitely feel more confident in Thielen – I think both. I think Thielen's shown that he still has it at his older age. Where Robinson's going to be what twenty nine when the season begins, so and you, you or do, close to it. You do have Van Jefferson here as a nice pivot. If you are anti Allen Robinson, and we could be wrong there, Allen Robinson could easily come out have a great resurgent year. Uh, but if he is the Allen Robinson we saw last year, then Van Jefferson has a real opportunity here to be the number two in, in this offense, um, which, you know, he's familiar with. And I think where he's going right now, if you're in best ball drafts, he's one of my favorite late round targets. I mean, it, for a redraft league, you probably aren't going to draft him at all, but he's a name to consider. And I'll throw this out there. This is the first time Stafford's his 40 touchdowns in a really, really long time. It's more likely than not that that number comes down. If the running game is better, he may be a better yeah. NFL quarterback, more efficient, and a worse fantasy quarterback. And those two can coexist very easily. Um, let's take a quick break, and we'll get into uh, the hometown Cardinals. I do want to ask Al Borland a question. Is that okay? Sure. Um, he's our resident Packer fan. Uh, Russell Wilson or Aaron Rodgers? Who are you going to dinner with? Aaron Rodgers. Okay. All right. I know that. I know that you've not been the biggest fan of, of Rodgers, the the man. That is correct. As curmudgeon -y as he is, I think he would be fun at dinner. Uh, like, I don't I don't yeah. mind going to dinner. Whereas, Russell Wilson would be weird, man. What would he <laughs> even order? Ooh. I don't know. What? He'd it, probably hit a buffet. He'd get the black. Unlimited. Yeah, the black uh, bean okay. burger type of thing. Oh, oh is that what he would go yeah. with? Yeah. What is, is he, Rodgers is getting the steak after he asked for all the recommendations? Maybe. I don't, yeah. Unless they recommend steak. <laughs> oh, okay. The yeah. contrarian mm -hmm. play? Then, he, then it's a burger. Hmm. Okay. Depends if he's on his cleanse at the time. Yeah, that oh, too. Yeah. I, which, that's all new to me. I didn't, I missed that. That he was really into the uh, pretty extreme cleanses. Yeah, from both sides. Yeah, very extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> or don't. Uh, <laughs> the Cardinals, 11 and 6 last year. The way the season ended, I was... They I were 11 and 6. That's where I'm going. <laughs> I scrolled down to... Really? We have these in order of, like, finish. And I hit 11 and 6, and I go, they were the second in the division? Um, it started great. What was it? 7 and 0, oh, right? 7 and 0. Oh. And then uh, we decided to show up to a game. 44 seconds and an A.J. Green turning around from 8 and 0. Oh. 
Yeah, and um, the preseason win total last year was eight. They hit eleven, so they outperformed that. Uh, three and four in one score games, so it wasn't it wasn't like they were just getting there with those anomalous one score wins. They went eight and one on the road. That was shocking. They had trouble at home last year. Uh, the projected win total this year, eight and a half. So uh, higher than it was last year, but obviously lower than where they finished last year. Um, does this help you? The last two Super Bowl champions hosted the Super Bowl, and Arizona is hosting it this year. Do you oh, think? baby! Oh, if these trends continue, I think we're I think we're here to to break the trend. Yeah, I think we can buck <laughs> this trend pretty easily. Let's buck it. Eleventh uh, yeah. in points per game. <laughs> <laughs> Eighth in total yards, twelfth in pace of play. Um, you know it's going to be some guesswork again with Arizona at the beginning of the year when it comes to finding the fantasy stars on this team outside of their quarterback because DeAndre Hopkins suspended for six games to start the season, and uh, Chase Evans has departed, and those were two pretty big pieces of the offense they made the trade for um hollywood brown you got that drop you got that you got that for me we updated that right did we did we get the new one we'll find out hollywood! Yes. we did hey um so look at us christian kirk out the door as well um you know it, it was a tale of two halves for arizona they ended in a putrid fashion all the off-season narrative around Kyler Murray that has kind of faded away and still doesn't have a new contract, but nobody's talking about this every 30 seconds anymore. But on the field, this was a great offense. And going into the upcoming season, you know, I like Hollywood a lot to start this year. This I is agree. a player that knows and understands the offense. All reports out of Arizona is that it's been just a smooth acclimation and he's going to be the most valuable pass-catching weapon in this offense until DeAndre Hopkins returns and maybe beyond. Yeah, absolutely. With Christian Kirk and DeAndre Hopkins out of the lineup, I mean, when, when DeAndre Hopkins went down last year, it coincided when Kyler himself went down, but then Kyler got back without Hopkins and was not the same without him. The entire Cardinals' offensive system was not the same without him. So I think the trade for Hollywood Brown was exceptionally important for the Cardinals to even have a chance. Zach Ertz became basically the like number one target in this offense, and when Zach Ertz is your main target, it's not going to go well. So right. having uh, Hollywood Brown there for the beginning of the year, I think he's a good draft pick. You've got an explosive uh, big play guy who – was so good on deep targets, he can get open because he's got that electric speed, and Kyler's deep target accuracy has gotten better every single year. He's among the best in the league. He, you know, it, It's really a match made in heaven, or you could say a match made in college where they were college teammates and you know, lit college football on fire. So I, I do think that they are going to get off to a good start, those two together, um, and, and Zach Ertz, which really – for us drafters, for us home leagues, that's really all that matters. Like, if I knew that someone was going to get off to a great six-week start and then trail off, I am always fine drafting that player. Sure. Yeah, and, and it's not going to be a, you know, they, they traded a first-round pick for Hollywood. It's not going to be a, all right, well, DeAndre's back, take a, take a seat. It's just going to be, you know, we had plenty of games last year where Christian Kirk was relevant alongside DeAndre Hopkins and things like that. So, yeah, maybe the numbers aren't as prolific. Maybe they stay that way. We don't really know. I mean, Hopkins is getting older. Um, it wasn't, you know, he, he his fantasy value was built on touchdowns last year versus the massive volume we saw in his first year in Arizona. So it's very interesting. What else is interesting is the way this, this team had to, maybe because of injury, transition into two tight end sets over the back half of the year. And then, you know, I, you might roll your eyes and say, well, that's not a big deal. Then they paid Zach Ertz again. And then they drafted Trey McBride, the most highly regarded pass catching tight end in the draft. So you might see a lot more of that, um, despite the you know Hopkins is still out, and right. you might see two tight ends on on the field. And you know I don't know if any of us would, you know we're not going to be streaming Trey McBride. No, but in a dynasty league, you know he is a very good player. Yeah, McBride is very interesting for dynasty. Zach Ertz reluctantly is very interesting for redraft that hot start that Jason was talking about I mean, in 12 games 
Zach Ertz saw essentially 20% of the targets last year for Arizona, and he's going to see a lot of targets over those first six weeks. Can he get in the end zone? Uh, TBD, but Zach Ertz could be pulling in five receptions a game while DeAndre Hopkins is out, and that's I mean, then get that late, you know, in the in the back of the eighth round, in the early ninth round, and then go from there. Like a month in, then try and readdress your the the tight end position. But I think that he's just grossly <laughs> undervalued right now in the draft. Yeah, and gross is the right word. Yes, not not that his he's really undervalued. It's gross that I'm saying he's undervalued. Yeah. Right. Uh, rushing production for Kyler went down last year. Uh, eight point three rush attempts per game back in twenty twenty. Last year it was down to six point three. Hard not to attribute that total in part to the ankle injury and the return after the ankle injury in week 11. Um, he was the fourth best quarterback in points per game. He That's the headline for Kyler, and he was great the year before with the, Josh Allen. It's hard to remember how good Kyler was over the first seven games before he got hurt in week eight. In that time, I mean, he was he was throwing nearly two and a half uh, touchdowns a game. He was rushing for a half. So, I mean – on average, Kyler was scoring three touchdowns a game while while throwing for 280 yards. Five of those seven games, he was a top 10 quarterback. Yes. Two of those games, he was a top one quarterback. He, he was, was the quarterback. Good. He was one. in the so top one? He was in the top one of all quarterbacks for fantasy football. In fact, it's a the, league company. the first two weeks of the season, he was 100% of the quarterback ones. <laughs> very. That's a good stat. Yeah. It's that's pretty, a deep, look, pretty wild. When they're fully healthy, it's DeAndre Hopkins. It's Hollywood Brown, and then you do have A.J. Green back. You've got Rondale well, Moore. See, I don't want to talk have about Zach Ertz. Green. I no, want to talk about Rondale, though. Yeah, Rondale. Go ahead. Like Rondale, it, I don't know if it's being picked up nationally, but I, there's a lot of, you know, it, it, maybe it's just coach speak, but there is still a lot of chatter coming from Cliff Kingsbury about Rondale having a very expanded role in this offense, which, to be fair to Rondale, he doesn't have to do much more for it to be a very expanded role, but a second round pick a year ago, athletics just off the chart ha to start the year, wasn't getting on the field a ton, but his targets per route run, meaning when he was on the field, Kyler was very interested in throwing him the ball. So, and he projects to be a starter with this team, especially if they're running three wide. So he's going extremely late in fantasy drafts. And I think that he, Rondale is one of those players to me that when it's late and you're, like, you're just throwing some darts on someone that could have a very surprising season, he fits the mold to me of great quarterback, high-powered offense, huge opportunity. But you'll know in the first two weeks, and you can dump is, him if is it Rondale work. more is his, is his role actually increased or is it just more of the same and you can move on from him? He yeah. was on an 80-target pace last year before the injury. Over under 100 targets for Rondell Moore this year in Arizona. I'm going to take the under. Yeah, I, I would take the under, but there's a chance. Yeah, his he, and he's electric. I think he'll get to 100. They just might all be behind the line of scrimmage. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the the other the last wide receiver here to discuss where people need to know what do I do with DeAndre Hopkins in my drafts. There's a, there's giant question marks around that. Thankfully, this isn't one of those questionable injuries. His injury, which he did have, he's he's good to go. Uh, he's healthy for training camp. This is a six-week suspension uh, for popping positive on PEDs. So you know you're going to not have him for the first six months, but you know he's been a – Six weeks. For six six <laughs> weeks. Uh, but he's been a fantasy superstar whenever he's been on the field. That being said, when you bring in Hollywood and start getting this offense going with Hollywood with Zach Ertz, we don't know for sure that – when Hopkins comes back, he would be this top six type of wide receiver. Could he be? Absolutely. We've seen it. But could he be a wide receiver 15 type? Absolutely. And if that's the case, yeah. waiting six weeks for a guy that could come back and be a wide receiver 15 is a massive mistake in my opinion, especially where he's going. He's going to the back of the sixth. Personally, this is just my take, here's wide receivers going after him that I would much rather have to start the season. Amon Ross St. Brown. Brandon Cooks, Darnell Mooney, Juju Smith Schuster, Devonta Smith, like those are Give me are some eighth round wide receivers, just so I understand the context. Sure. 
Because I think it's about, you know, six weeks is a little more than 40% of your fantasy season, depending on what your format is. But Eighth round wide receivers, yeah. we've got Rashad Bateman, Elijah Moore, and Gabriel Davis, and Brandon Ayuk. I, would, I think I would take all of those guys. No, I'd guys. take Hopkins over all those guys. I would take all those guys except for Ayuk over Hopkins. You so would take all those I would guys take Elijah. Right. I would take Elijah Moore over Hop. I would take I mean, Elijah Gabriel Davis yeah, and, and Gabe, Bateman for yep. sure over over Hop. Okay, Hopkins was very good to start the year. Yeah, it's just touchdown. a matter of lowest it, receiving yards per game since his rookie year. And the, and the route bush man, the route tree was disintegrated into a lonely desert plant of death. I guess I just have a different opinion. I, I not that I'm I'm not actively seeking. DeAndre Hopkins, but he was the number five yeah. wide receiver the last time he played a full season in Arizona. Last year was injury marred. You you will go into the week seven, or I don't know if they have a bye week seven, but you'll go into their seventh game, and DeAndre Hopkins will be the number one focal point of the offensive game plan. That's what's going to happen in Arizona. So whatever that means to you, if it's worth waiting, if it's not worth waiting, that's going to be the equation. They He's paid – a, a huge amount of money and heralded as one of the top actual pass catchers in football. So if that's, if I'm getting the wide receiver 14, that think, that's amazing. Size of your bench matters for like, if you have a bench that's shallow, you know, four or five, that's yeah. It, it, it's, it's there does a, become Hopkins a, is a very difficult decision to me. There's just a point where it's worth, Holding that, and the way I would rationalize it in my head is, you rotate through waiver wire guys that are in and out on your roster every week, including wide receivers you're taking blind shots on. Right? I mean, we we're going to spend two roster spots a week moving players in and out for most rosters, and you know what he'll be when he gets back. So that will be the the game you have to play. You might not it might not be worth it. Sixth round, all the names that you said in the sixth round, I'd rather have over DeAndre Hopkins. No question about it. Um. So I, maybe that's maybe in your league it's a ninth round decision for you. Maybe it's a sure. tenth round decision for you, uh, or in Jason's case, maybe never. Yeah, I think the tenth round I would I would hop in. <laughs> oh. uh, let's talk James Conner, shall we? Um, to oh, ignore my uh, awesome pun. Uh, yeah, James Conner was great last year. Obviously, he overperformed in the touchdown category. You wouldn't expect him to. Uh, get as many touchdowns however which was 18 yes uh the you do know that he is the premier goal line back for a team that likes to run it inside the five where you can't stack the box because kyler will go whoop yeah. and go out to the outside so you've got to spy him james Conner's going to score a ton of touchdowns yes it will be fewer than last year and still be very very good for fantasy plus he can catch the ball. Chase Edmonds is gone. And the running back amalgamation that they've brought in behind him does not seem like... Daryl Williams. Daryl Williams, Keontae Ingram, and Eno, Eno Benjamin from a couple years ago. It doesn't seem like there is a Chase Edmonds replacement. I think it's going to be a couple guys coming in and spelling James What Conner. is, uh, Kyle, if you can look up, I want to know what the over-under is on, on total touchdowns for James Conner. Do they have that number? I can look it up. I feel like he's locked for double digit. Yes. I mean, he, yeah, he had, I'll take he had 10 plus rushing touchdowns. He had five games last year, five with more than one touchdown. That's kind of wild. And and if you go back, he he is built for touchdowns. You go back to Kenyon Drake, who wasn't in this system. He was still getting all those same opportunities that James Conner was getting. Wasn't quite as effective with him. And the center position wasn't quite as good then. Yeah. So we're not expecting 18 touchdowns, but we know that he's a featured back on an offense that was, you know, in the top half of the league. Fair? Yeah, and yep. he's a good value right now. He's not being drafted as like a first round or a top of the second round running first back. First round would be scary. Yeah, Connor. and I've, I've seen the criticism. They think it's bias, hometown bias. But you, you don't understand how much we hate the Cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not drafting Hop. So the line is nine and a half. See, that's what I was wondering. Okay. Like, I, I think he's a lock for double-digit touchdowns. over the, Now, if injury. Else, yeah, I was going mean, to say, that's, that's, betting unders this time of year is usually the smart play just because if you get injured, Yep, you hit your under. Yeah, yeah that that would really hurt. You get to about nine halfway through the year, and you lose Connor for the rest of the season. The Forty ers ten and seven last year, um, seven and two to finish the season, five and five and one score games. The preseason win total was ten and a half. They were under that. 
The projected Vegas win total right now is 10 for San Francisco? Yes. Wow. I know. It, it is. Wow. When you think about Where, the Cardinals with uh, you know an MVP candidate in Kyler Murray last year who's gotten better at 8.5, to have a Trey Lance-led 49ers out here with a projected win total of 10 seems I think you get an extra win and a half if you have Kyle Shanahan as your coach. I agree. So I think that's what it comes down to. Um, confidence. I mean, they were 31st in pace of play last year, 13th in points per game under Jimmy Garoppolo, 7th in total yards. And you should lose a game and a half for having Cliff. So that makes okay. sense. <laughs> okay, it's one direction or the other. I also agree. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, to, to be 7th in total yards and have an offense that was in the top half in points per game and then just kick the quarterback out the door and say, hey, we're moving on, you know, you have a system in place, right? You have something that you have confidence in with Kyle Shanahan, the weapons around him, um, Elijah Mitchell, George Kittle, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk. Uh, they are an efficient offense. That's what they've been under Kyle Shanahan. They're, it, it's impressive. Elijah Mitchell's going to dominate. That's that's where Can I'm at right now. Can we get that chopped up and yeah. uh, and saved? You, you, I'm starting to be on that side too. No, I think look, it's all lined up. I mean, the I remember reality, when Raheem Moster was going to dominate. <laughs> the, the, uh, going back historically, every year the 49ers have a new running back. It happened last year, and it was a surprise in Elijah Mitchell. So I think there's a lot of fear that it won't be Elijah Mitchell. There's not a lot of draft capital. They are fine saying, "Nah, let's go with the next guy." Kyle Shanahan don't care. He will do whatever he thinks is best for an individual game plan, yada, yada. But Elijah Mitchell was a revelation. He was he fit the system perfect. He explodes through the hole, and he's younger. You know, he was like the new Moster. Uh, he had the most elite usage of any Shanahan running back in San Francisco from week 10 uh, and through the playoffs, 20-plus opportunities in seven straight games. Now, he couldn't handle that workload and got injured, and so there is that fear. I don't think Elijah Mitchell's going to play 17 games, but I don't think most running backs are going to play 17 yeah. games. He's going at the 5-6 turn right now. For a guy that can – what are you going to do if you bring in a mobile quarterback, right? This isn't a pass-catching running back already in Elijah Mitchell. This is a guy who's just bursting off big chunk plays. You bring in a mobile, essentially rookie quarterback this year who doesn't have the experience, and you are a great running team – they're going to run the ball nonstop. They're going to jam it down your throats, and Elijah Mitchell's first guy up. Yeah, I mean, Lance is going to take away touchdown opportunities. That's, sure. that's, that's absolutely going to happen. And then the other issue was the shoulder, ribs, concussion, finger, knee, which was the five injuries he suffered last year, which they did invest in. a. They drafted uh, a running back. They did. They, uh, the, which was Davis Price, right? Yes, uh, Ty Davis Price. The, the thing to me when looking at the 49ers, this, this year's running back room, Looking at the history of, of the running backs that have had success for Kyle Shanahan under San Francisco, Elijah Mitchell, injuries, absolutely a challenge for the missile. But the guys in the room with Elijah Mitchell, I know that Shanahan, they're, they're the people that keep bringing these other running backs in, but they, they don't like that archetype of like, Ty Davis Price is not fast. Trey Sermon is not fast. Why'd they draft them? I don't know. See, that, this I is the problem with that premise is that if we were here last year and we were talking about the running backs in the room with Raheem Mostert, not one of us would have talked about Elijah Mitchell. That's the problem I have is that somebody else earns the trust in training camp. Though You know, you don't know behind the scenes, were they happy with Mitchell's recovery from injury? Were they unhappy with it? Fair. Is, so I'm just coloring in the other side of the argument. I actually agree with you guys. Like right now, like, I, I would go Elijah Mitchell, I think, over Cam Akers, and they're going at the same place. I was going to ask you guys that. Which of those two oh. guys do you have more confidence in? Because that's about where they're both that's going. A, that's a very difficult question. Same division, question marks uh, on both teams. I think I go Akers. I, I think by, I, <laughs> that I, was so much confidence. I think by the time that hey. drafts roll around, and, and, and I've seen this on Underdog right now, I think Elijah will be going behind Akers, and I'll take the value. Don't in go Elijah with, Mitchell. In Elijah Mitchell. Debo. Debo was dominant last year. Yep. Um, you can't tackle him. He plays two positions if you need him well, to. He did, Yeah, he did it the second half of last year. And um, what is that? Only three of his 16 touchdowns came within 
10 yards. Mm-hmm. They're all deep. Long touchdowns. Oh, those are so delightful for fantasy. They're delightful for fantasy, but they are hard to repeat. It's not like James Conner, who's assured of getting No, they're not 15. that hard for Debo. <laughs> sure. I mean, it's like look, Tyreek. Oh, he's a man. I mean, I, thank you. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would doubt. Like, what was his total touchdowns last year? Do we have that? Six and eight? 16. 16 total. Yeah. So yeah. What, did he throw a couple or something? Oh, that, I, including I see, the playoffs. I see, okay. I see six. We don't include the playoffs. Yeah, Kyle. come on. Here. We don't include the playoffs. It's a fantasy football what? show. What about you had the year before, too? Why is Kyle here? <laughs> Good grief. Go home. Six and eight. 14. Good math. Um, that's a lot. That is a lot. That yeah. is more than what you would expect. Um, I, I know he was one of the players that, you know, had a very, very high, uh, touchdown rate over expectation. So he outperformed, but some of these great players, they year after year outperformed, not to the degree Debo did this year. Um, and there is the, the giant question mark here of change at quarterback. You should be more, I, in my opinion, we should be more confident of Debo than we are as a fantasy community. Okay. Because he's a great player with a great head coach. You know, it, you make a transition at quarterback that has you kind of going, what's going to happen? Well, here's what's going to happen. They're going to go into the game, and then they're going to get Debo the ball a bunch of times, and they don't care. How, like, he's at least capable of getting it in ways that a lot of other wide receivers aren't capable of getting the ball. He can be in the screen game. He can be in the – you can pitch him the ball out of the backfield. You're not going to see them run this offense – on the back of Brandon Ayuk. It's going to be on the back of Debo. It's going to be on the back of Kittle. And I think we need to – I think we should have more confidence than we do. I, I would agree with all of your premise uh, in this in the sense that Kyle Shanahan is going to form game plans. And it's, it's funny, the way that he designs plays to get a specific play to a specific player – um and and that is Debo or Kittle. It's it's not Ayuk. Ayuk is a you know is is the uh, uh the second read. And so Debo will get a, enough uh work, enough targets to be fantasy relevant. And he's super hard to tackle right now. He's not being drafted as uh, you know a first Certainly not rounder. The number two. You can get him at the two three turn sometimes. Uh, so I'm I'm fine taking Debo there. I still I still personally worry about. I mean, the injury history, I know he, he played last year and was great, but, you know, he does have a long track record of breaking down. So I, I have that fear, and I don't know if that's – it's not fair. If he, you – I mean, yeah. yeah it's, it's, I would say that's not fair. Yeah, I would say it's not fair. It, I, I said it first, though, so <laughs> I get well, you full, can't hurt full me. credit. Look, you Elijah, can't hurt me. Elijah Mitchell, who you like a lot, got hurt five separate times last year. Mm, nice counter argument. <laughs> <laughs> And about build, building game plans around George Kittle, unfortunately, you can't do that when he's on the bench. And he was hurt again and still banged up. So, um, yeah, it's tough. And then with the Trey Lance, I mean, it seems like that the whole arm strength thing was just baloney, at least the way that his teammates are talking about it. Or not the arm strength, arm fatigue, yeah. worries. I think people maybe, maybe myself included, they're searching for the negative on Trey Lance because it's more entertaining, it's more interesting uh, as a storyline when a team fails with the number three pick in the draft. Like that's sure, I that's just kind of that, like, yeah. oh man, yeah. Kyle Shanahan screwed something up. I it's, can't believe it. You know, it. For us, as we are Cardinal fans, so when the 49ers fail, it it does feel good. But I have I have full confidence that Trey Lance is going to be the starter. I have I'm very confident that he is going to be fantastic for fantasy football, not just. Based on the legs, like he has, he has a rocket ship of an arm, and he will throw the ball down the field like just an absolute elite average depth of target in this in the small amount that we've seen him, which small sample. And then like uh, it, Warren Sharp had like a really interesting write up. He's Warren Sharp has his huge book out right now, and he was highlighting how quarterbacks under Kyle Shanahan. They're always top 10 in expected completion rate because Kyle Shanahan is just such a master at scheming good, easy completions, recognizing how important that is and that just giving you even more confidence. Like Maybe Trey, Trey Lance is going to be a raw prospect right now because he's barely played any football. He's going to be the youngest starting quarterback in the NFL in his second year in the NFL. But 
the system is set up for him to succeed so well and be a potential fantasy monster. Yeah, you you brought it up uh, on our last show, Andy, of the question of should should one hundred percent of the time you be taking Trey Lance, even if you already have another quarterback, his ceiling is enormously yes. high. Uh, and and I love getting Trey Lance as cathedral levels. Oh yeah, you're talking <laughs> forty five feet in the the main area. Like, <laughs> in the main area? <laughs> yes. The the big room. You know, the the cathedral big room that they call it. The main area. You know, like in the a, cathedral area. Up where yeah. uh, uh, Quasimodo's at. Right, yeah. You don't want to see him. You put him up in the 45-foot rafters. No, that's the Le'Veon Bell Tower. Um, man. <laughs> the main room. <laughs> Is George Kittle, the real last, closing the book on San Francisco, is George Kittle's average draft position, which is the late third as the fourth tight end off the board, is that palatable for you this year because of the difference he can make? Or are you kind of – you don't want to be the guy that lost the injury gamble at tight end in the third round? I, I am uh, – George Kittle is probably the tight end I have the most of, of the, the big names. I'm not really willing to go first round on Travis Kelsey, and most of the time there's players I prefer over Mark Andrews in the second – in the leagues that I've been in, Kyle Pitts is the third uh, being drafted, and then it goes Waller, and then Kittle sometimes is dropping to the fourth, the fifth. I've seen Kyle, you got him the other day in the sixth or seventh round. It was ridiculous. Kittle was the tight end four last year, and when he puts up big games, they're monstrous. They are game-changing. They win the week for you. I, I think if Kittle slips in a draft, He's going to end up on my roster. Um, it's going to be Kittle or a late tight end for me this year. Yeah, the late third to me is – that's very acceptable. And, and risky, absolutely risky. So what kind of Where's fantasy Waller player are Where's Waller then, just ahead of him? In sleeper, he's going behind him. Yeah, give me Waller. Really? Yeah, I have, I have a – I'm getting very excited about Darren Waller. Nice. Let's do it, Andy. You want to bet that one? Waller, Waller versus, versus Kittle? Kittle? Yeah, let's oh, do it. Oh, that's a let's fun go. bet. Just need to find the button. Water bet. Yeah. I feel like the median score would favor the odds to Waller, but the upside is far more on George Kittle's side to me. Far more. Far more. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. I mean, Kittle's the big play guy. Waller is a, was a PPR machine, and now you got Devontae Adams soaking up, what, 25-plus percent. Okay. All right. I, not that I'm against Waller. No, I think, I, think, I, think you, I think we underestimate the value of – a good play caller in Las Vegas and putting him in a good position to succeed because I don't know if you'd feel the same way about George Kittle if uh, Mr. John Gruden was the head coach. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, maybe. We'll uh, never know. No, thank goodness. Uh, this, uh, the Seahawks, let's talk about them. 7-10 and ten last year. The Russell Wilson era is over. The 10.4 wins per year is probably over as well. And um, you know Pete Carroll before Russ was seven and nine and seven and nine. I I just saw their win total their their twenty twenty one preseason. That was last year. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Thank they goodness. were nine last year with Russ. Oh my gosh, I saw the wrong Where do you, number. Okay, don't look then. Where do you <laughs> okay. think they are this year? I I feel like they should be six and a half. Okay, Mike, six. No lower than both of those. Thank goodness. Okay. I saw five, nine five. in my. I was like, it's about to. <laughs> Run to the <laughs> Run draft to the be like, I gotta <laughs> bet this like crazy. Five and a half. Five and a half. Okay. Started at six, bet down to five and a half. Um you know, looking at last year's offensive metrics for Seattle feels a little stupid, to be honest with you. Yep. Um Russ isn't there. But the, the one thing that you can look at though is with Russ. They still wanted to run the ball. Yeah, thirty first in pass attempts. So now this is the this is you get your chance, Pete Carroll, to do what you've always wanted and just say the the quarterback is not winning this game. And you're right, he's not going to. Look, the the highest odds for Drew Locke to have success would be a team where he is thirty seconds in pass attempts. It's fair. Yeah, I mean this is this is not looking good right now. I didn't I didn't know how long we'd have to talk about them. Um, also, I are you guys who did you who do you have in as the starter, Locke or Gino? I think it'll be. I think they'll just skip it. <laughs> <laughs> just pass. I have Drew Locke out that way okay. right now. I I think it'll be Gino. 
I, when it comes I, down to it. Yeah, see, I, I have the – I think it'll be close, <laughs> but I think Locke will end up getting the opportunity because we've seen Geno for more snaps in the NFL than we've seen Drew Locke. But I don't – look, I don't know. It could be Jimmy Garoppolo. And there's rumors of – this is yeah. this is that same situation. where They're talking about Drew Locke the way the Panthers were talking about Darnold this offseason. That's how they're talking about him, which was like, Darnold's the guy. He's going to mm-hmm. be the guy. He's still got a potential. And just kidding, we traded for Baker. Which, by the way, that's an open competition. Did you know that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we've heard. Totally. Yeah. Just, we've it's heard. It's going to be uh, – man, I wonder who's going to win. So when Drew Locke is being talked about like this in a way that is, I would say, removed from facts, then, yeah. then maybe Jimmy Garoppolo arrives and maybe – look, if Jimmy Garoppolo – This team is so much better if Jimmy Garoppolo If he Garoppolo arrives, there, I care about DK Metcalf in a new too. way. I care about Tyler Lockett. And I really – look, Noah Fant I still think can be interesting this season. Um, you get to these situations where they look so – and H- Houston, Houston's an example of it last year. Um, Jacksonville, uh, there are situations where you kind of – you don't even want to gaze in the direction of the offense. It's a, it's like offensive. Like, Jason, you wear glasses. You'd remove them if you were going to look towards Seattle's offense. So I don't you, want to see that. Uh, so it's obfuscated. Um, but they get to play the same – you know – Four quarters of football every week, and their offense takes the field. And I think Noah Fant is going to be a part of the offense and, and a relevant part of the offense. And so um, I I am of the opinion that if you have to pick up somebody in the last round of your draft and you're in the Gerald Everett category, the Cole Komet category, Noah Fant belongs in that same group because he's actually gone out and, and had pretty relevant he's weeks. Decent, yeah. Yeah, he's had he's had decent weeks. He obviously has the athleticism to get it done. This is one though where when you're talking about he's behind DK Metcalf, behind Tyler Lockett as the third option in an offense led by Geno or Locke, assuming that it's not uh, Garoppolo or a different quarterback, I, I just can't get myself to pull the trigger on him. Will he finish as you know the tight end ten? Sure, but usually that's still irrelevant. I would rather take a tight end as a piece of a better offense and hope for more touchdowns because I don't think you see, you know, eight, nine, ten touchdowns here for Noah Fant just because that means Drew Locke's throwing touchdowns or Geno Smith is, and that's probably well, not they happening. Do, they do have – if it's Drew Locke, they do have a connection. And last year sure. last year he was 90 targets in that system with other weapons on the outside, 670 yards. Um, so Look, it's not going to be pretty. I'm not um, saying it's going to be pretty. Moving forward, it's Drew Locke or it's Geno. How exactly are you guys valuing DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett? You know, fantasy studs for multiple years, both extremely talented in in their archetype of wide receiver. Give but, me Lockett at his average draft position. Okay, so Lockett going right now in the eighth as the wide receiver thirty nine. DK Metcalf, wide receiver fifteen, but he's just he's a absolute monster of a man. Yeah, I would much rather have DK Metcalf overlock it in general as the draft position dictates but as the wide receiver 15 I just have a hard time seeing that happen right now I've got him as my wide receiver 24 and I love betting on a guy who's got the physical talents and the gifts where you know he could break some tackles and and take a bad pass uh, 80 yards for a touchdown so I I like uh, DK Metcalf when he's slipping to that value in leagues that don't want him but in general I don't really want a piece of this passing game if I want a Seahawk it's probably going to be Rashad Penny. Tyler uh, Lockett at wide receiver 39, though. I mean, I've got him. I mean, this is the this is the Brandon Cooks problem that people had last year. This is what I'm talking about, not looking at that offense. I, I, it makes sense. I think that his targets will probably be up from uh, where he's being drafted right now. But, like, when, when I stat him out, you know, I, Tyler Lockett is my wide receiver. So, this is a player that was 15th, 14th, 9th, and 13th. You know how much I love Tyler Lockett. I have been a Tyler Lockett stan. That's too low. It it very well might be, but, I mean, we've seen great wide receivers. You know, we bring up Larry Fitzgerald all the time. When when he goes from uh, a, a bad wide receiver who's like the wide receiver 46, Larry's great. But if you don't have a guy that can get you the ball, and if he's not the number one in the offense, I just don't see a world where Tyler Lockett is anything other than uh, a few big plays on the season that you can't predict, and you're never going to know where to start him in your home leagues. That's Mike? where I'm at. I yeah, I'm. I think I'm out. Unfortunately, Rashad Penny. 
very okay. So there was that. I, I guess this is worth talking about. Ken Walker, we're all very excited for the rookie drafted in the second round out of Michigan. Tremendous pure runner. No, really, no pass catching in his in his production profile, which sucks. Uh, at it, watching him catch passes, it doesn't seem like he is as, as a Jordan Howard, but he just wasn't used like that. But he is being drafted multiple rounds ahead of Rashad Penny, who's like Rashad Penny's going in the ninth round. Rashad Rashad Penny is being drafted as barely a running back three. Despite at the end of the year, like carrying people to fantasy championships, should be the starter. Like they brought him back on the one year prove it deal. I normally in these situations, I'm very drawn to the rookie because I want the youth, I want the upside. But in this situation, I I think it's absolutely wild that Rashad Penny is as being overlooked as who I view as the starter. So where do you where do you guys fall between? Walker versus Penny. Yeah, I I think Rashad Penny is the starter for this team. Um, I I believe he's a very good running back. He has not been able to stay healthy. Uh, when he's been given the opportunity, he is phenomenal. If he gets double digit carries, he's been good for fantasy. Obviously, that's been with Russell Wilson. I don't expect them as many touchdown opportunities, but he can have big chunk plays. He can have breakaway runs, and I think he is going to get the work over Ken Walker this year. And he's going three rounds behind him, so I, I I'm in, I'm in on the value that Rashad Penny represents. I'm not sitting here saying I think he's going to be a a top twelve running back, but I definitely think he's going to outperform his running back thirty six uh, draft position right now. All right, it's underdog fantasy time. Best ball breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. We've been, people have been asking for it. So for I, the roar? Yeah, I don't oh yeah. know. I got it back there. Who are these people? There's been two of them at least. <laughs> like where? Your Twitter? They're saying yeah, we want to hear Jason kind of gargly. Yeah. And I, gargle I mean, screen. I like it when the on the mock draft drop. Well, but that, that weird, less is more with that That sound. seemed inappropriate. Well, we'll see what the people say. Oh, leave, no. leave your comment. Oh, no. <laughs> leave your comment below. All right. More or less Jason gargly dragon roars. Best ball breakdown brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Uh, we're giving tips, insights, observations for playing best ball. Mike, you've got something to share. Sure. So today's tip, it, it's it's kind of a short and, and sweet one, and it's a there are, there are so many things to be thinking of when you are in a best ball draft of you know the roster construction, putting together when do I get my stack in, all of these, these tips we have been giving, and the – the emphasis is on wide receivers. You're playing in a three wide receiver and a flex league. But this is just a reminder. At a certain point, do not forget about these running backs who are, are being drafted a little bit later. We So per Hayden Winks in, look, of underdog fantasy, so I mean the guy knows what he's talking about for fantasy football, one, and with underdog fantasy – uh, in general, about 50% of flex spots should be filled by running backs. 45% should be filled by wide receivers. So like, there is a place for these running backs who are getting undervalued compared to the wide receivers who are going in that position. So for, ex in, for example, you know, uh, the running back 30 since 2015, the running back 30 on average has scored the same as the wide receiver 40. So when you're getting into those wide wide receiver 45, but the running back 30 is still on the board, don't be afraid to, to get the running back in there just because you feel like, I got to load up on these wide receivers. Guys like Kareem Hunt, Rashad Penny, Chase Edmonds, who is – we've highlighted him recently on the show of he's – he feels like an absolute screaming I value. I hate that you're bringing these names. Those are the <laughs> Jason, three. Jason, this is our job. I know it's our job, but I'd like to win, too. So those are the names well, you I'm always grabbing at value. You have plenty of teams with these guys, but Chase Edmonds is the running back 35. You know? We don't have to release the podcast anymore. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's cut this part out. But you know, Melvin Gordon is the running back 36. I, he, Gordon's not going to be a top 12 guy, but he's, he's going to overperform that running back 36. And just remember that, while you want to load up on the wide receivers, it there does come a balance and a tipping point where these leftover running backs are still going to be good enough and outscoring these wide receiver 45 and getting into your flex play. 
All right, that was Best Ball Breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. Start playing on Underdog today, right now. They'll match your first deposit up to $100 if you use the code BALLERS. That's going to do it for today's episode of the Fantasy Footballers. We appreciate each and every one of you tuning in. Thank you for subscribing. Apple Podcasts, uh, you can click that follow button on Spotify, wherever you're listening. Maybe you're on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. We've got some live stuff coming up over the next couple months. A lot more gargle roars <laughs> in store. Hopefully yeah. not. We'll ask the platform to add filters for that specifically. It's like the profanity filter and then your roars. In case they want to opt out. Just in case. Just in case. All right. Thank you for tuning in. Back with the Saturday show. See you then. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.